Hello, this is the lecture on banking procedures and control of cash. Controlling cash and overall banking procedures are very important, which is why there's a whole chapter spent on this. There are several learning objectives for this chapter, and as you read the chapter, you're going to notice that it's important to understand the whole process of depositing and writing and endorsing checks, then the process of reconciling a bank statement, establishing and replenishing petty cash, and establishing and replenishing a change fund. Cash is probably the most easily stolen or mishandled. Nowadays, a lot of um, transactions happen where cash isn't involved, but there still is a great deal of cash transactions, especially in the retail business. You need to protect all cash receipts and establish good internal controls. And as you move on, if you do, to accounting dual one or a higher level accounting, you'll find that um, the control of cash and internal controls is also um, very important. Internal control examples are responsibilities and duties of employees are divided, and this is referred to as separation of duties. Cash is deposited on a daily basis. Cash payments are made by check. Employees are rotated. Checks are authorized for payment, and bank accounts are reconciled monthly. These are the basic cash internal controls. So let's talk about depositing, writing, and endorsing checks. At the bank, that you, you get a signature card, and the bank asks you who is authorized to use your bank account. Then from there you have deposit slips and sometimes you have debit cards which you can you know issue out. Um, you can use anywhere a MasterCard or Visa is accepted if you have a debit card that carries the MasterCard or Visa logo. And as you probably know from personal side that the cash is immediately deducted upon use. An endorsement is signing or stamping one's name on the back of the check, and a payee has transferred the right to deposit the, the cash or the check to someone else. There are types of endorsement. A blank endorsement does not specify that a particular entity must endorse it. There's full endorsement, where you have to sign the back of the check with the name of the entity to who you're going to pay, and then there's restrictive endorsement. So let's see what those look like. Here's a blank endorsement. Here's a full endorsement and here is a restrictive endorsement. So there's different options that companies will implement. Journal entries to record deposits. When you have a sale, you have a debit to cash and a credit to sales. The proceeds of the collections of a company um, on accounts receivable are also a debit to cash and a, that, a credit to AR. So these two types of cash transactions can occur. <laughs> Credit cards, which are used by financial institutions and by credit card companies such as MasterCard, Visa, American Express, Discover. A drawback is that merchants typically must pay a service fee. So there are other sources of revenue as we've discussed um, in other chapters besides cash. Uh, debit cards are issued by the banks. The card is not an extension of credit. It's, it's like a cash transaction. The holder cannot spend more than the balance currently in his or her account. Um, and with minor exceptions it's treated the same as a credit card. Then you have your checkbook and most people are familiar when you open an account you can get a checkbook and then you get checks and you can cancel checks um, etc. So in the form of cash there's cash across the counter, there's a debit card and there's a checkbook. Those are all considered types of cash for the purpose of a transaction of cash. So here's a picture of a check. I think most people are familiar with a check. Um, there is a routing number and an account number. Um, if the written amount on the check does not match the amount expressed in the figures, the bank may pay the amount written in words, return the check upon um, as unpaid, or contact the drawer to see what was intended. Nowadays, with a lot of electronic um, things that go on, um, the check just runs through and then it, it processes. Records must be kept for all transactions. So here's a bank deposit showing all the deposits. Um, when checks are written, there's a check register, so you can see all the check numbers going through and the information. Once again, this looks very manual. If you're using a computer system like QuickBooks or something else, you get a check register that has information that's more um, technical looking. Then there's a bank statement. A bank statement reflects all the activity in the account during that period. It starts off with the beginning balance, then the checks the bank has paid are subtracted, deposits are added, and other charges or additions are indicated by little codes. So here's a little bank statement. It shows you information that you had um, checks totaling were subtracted, checks added were deposited. Here's your present balance, 
and your beginning balance. So you can see all the different information that throw, flows through a bank statement. Reconciling bank statements are really important. And depending on how complicated your business is, a bank reconciliation can be very complicated. So many companies have different bank accounts for different purposes, a payroll bank account, an operating bank account, an investment bank account to make it, um, to make the transactions easier to reconcile and also for controls. So when the steps to reconciliation are to calculate the deposits in transit and outstanding checks and recognize service charges and fees. Because as you know, just because you write a check doesn't mean somebody cashes it, and just because you deposit it doesn't mean it has cleared. So those are really the main um, differences in the book balance of cash and the bank balance of cash. So here's how you go through your bank reconciliation. You have your bank statement balance, and then you have your adjusted balance um, down below. So you take in and out the outstanding checks and the, um, the other information that hasn't cleared the bank statement. So we deduct the total of checks outstanding, and then if you made deposits um, since the statement date that you've put in your book, then you're going to add that through. So you're reconciling from your bank statement down through an adjusted balance. An NSF is a non-sufficient fund, a check that has been returned because the drawer did not have enough money to pay it. That's one thing that might you, you might see on your bank statement. A debit memorandum is a deduction from the account holder's balance or a credit memorandum is an increase in the account holder's balance. Some people see um, might see these as ACHs or EFTs. There's different words for money that goes through a bank um, statement or a bank account nowadays besides a check. Here's your step-by-step -step instructions and um, I've posted all of the PowerPoint slides out on Blackboard so you can pull these up and read them. You basically go through a list where you prepare a list of your deposits in transit, you prepare a list of your outstanding checks, you record any bank charges or credits, you compute the cash balance per your books, you enter the bank balance on the reconciliation, and then you total the deposits in transit, total the outstanding checks, and you calculate the balance per the reconciliation. And this should equal the balance on your general ledger. Sounds very easy, and like I said, if you don't have much going through your bank statement, it probably won't take you very long. Um, I mentioned a little bit ago that there also are electronic fund transfers that um, funds go in and out without a check, a use of a paper check. And then there's also ATM type transactions. So there's a lot going on in a bank account, which is why hopefully you can see that you need to reconcile this monthly. The advantages of online banking is it's convenient, it's available, it's fast, it's efficient, and it's effective. Um, the the thing about online banking is that it has some disadvantages. Startup may take time in order to register. There's a learning curve. Banking sites sometimes can be difficult to navigate. Bank sites change and for many people there's a trust thing. So online banking is good. You just have to make sure that you're still doing your bank rec whether you're online banking or you're using a checkbook. Fraudulent practices have gotten greater in the recent years. Phishing involves fake emails that attempt to obtain information about your sign-on and your username and your password. Skimming is the theft of credit card information used um, in an otherwise legitimate debit or credit card transaction, and that happens too. So there's many things that need to be watched as you're looking at your cash. Always keep your pin safe. Don't give it to anybody. Watch out for people who try to help you at an ATM. Um, look at the ATM before using it. Just kind of standard stuff that a business would and a person would um, think to do. The biggest thing here is look at your bank statement. Whether you're just your own personal statement or a business statement, make sure you look at that bank statement and, and you don't see anything weird going on it. Um, the Next thing we're going to talk about is petty cash. A petty cash fund is a little bit of cash that you might leave at the receptionist's desk or with your accountant that lets you go and do small cash transactions um, so you don't need to write a check. So you do need to keep track of them, you do need to book them in your books, and you do need to have all the receipts. It's normally an asset account and it has a normal debit balance just like any cash and there's somebody who oversees it. And Here's how to set up a petty cash fund. It's a new asset called petty cash and so you're taking basically cash out of cash. It's just a transfer between a petty cash and a regular cash. So you've you have um, created your petty cash. 
once you start spending out of it, um, then it depletes itself and it has to be replenished over time. Um, petty cash vouchers are, it, are the voucher with the date and an information about where the payment was made, um, the reason for the payment, etc. I require being a CFO in business that all petty cash transactions come in with a receipt. So it's not just a voucher, it's actually like an accounts payable where you have backup for everything that the person was purchasing. So the voucher, if you will, might be an internal um, form of, a, of an invoice, but you still have receipts attached to the back of it. Here's an example of a petty cash voucher that some company might make just to give you some backup. I make people sign things. If people are getting by using petty cash, I make the person who's getting the petty, petty cash sign it and the person who's replenishing it sign it so you have that um, mechanism in place. At the end of the month, you add up all your vouchers and your receipts, and at that point, you have to submit that in to have the petty cash replenished. Now, remember, this is just a subset of your cash. It's cash you took out of the bank and you put in a little box somewhere or a cash register. So all you're doing is taking into account the expenses and booking them into your GL. So here you see that the petty cash um, payments and the receipts are being recorded. So the voucher information is transferred to your, to your GL. Um, when you need petty cash uh, refund, uh, replenished, there's no postings done from the auxiliary record. The compiled information is used as a basis for a formal journal entry. A check is issued, and then the check has to be cashed. So typically you have someone responsible for going to the bank to cash the check to put the petty cash back in the box. So it might seem a little archaic, but there are times where businesses keep some cash on hand, and this is how you do it. Here's an example of what the journal looks like. So here was the original petty cash re, um, established, and here were the expenses that were incurred, and they need to go and replenish the petty cash. So notice a check is just written for cash. Someone goes down and cashes it and put the money back in the box. The only time you ever debit petty cash is to increase or you credit it to decrease your petty cash fund. Uh, let's talk about establishing a change fund. A change fund is made up of various denominations. Fund is placed in a cash register drawer, etc. So it's not like petty cash. It's a place where you need to make change. Um, handling transactions that involve cash over in short. Sometimes you go and you do your bank rec or something happens and you can't reconcile and there is missing cash. It is not a good thing when there's missing cash, but if there is, you need to account for it. So in this, you have a cash over and short. And the reason you do this is you. some companies will book to a miscellaneous expense, but it's really better to keep track of your cash over and short because you might have a problem and you might have employees that are um, stealing from you. So you really need to track your cash over and short. So here's a T account that shows you that a shortage is considered a miscellaneous expense, but like I said, if um, you can track it through cash over and short. An overage is other income, and an underage is miscellaneous expense. So here's an example where you had a pizza shop rang up the sales of five sixty for the day, but only had five thirty in cash. So there's thirty dollars missing. So they're going to debit five hundred thirty to cash and credit the sales, but then they've got this missing thirty dollars that they have to do something with. So by booking it to cash over in short, you'll be able to keep track by employee what's going on. Here's a journal entry. Here's another example where it goes the other way, where you have 610 instead of 560. So this time your cash over in short is um, like a miscellaneous revenue. So the swings in cash over in short, this is more of a retail business type situation. You want to keep track of this if you're the bookkeeper or the accountant. And here's um, another one where a local computer company established petty cash for 200 on November 30th. The petty cash box only had 160, and they only had vouchers for 32. So they're missing um, eight dollars. So they have to book it somewhere. So this can happen. These are examples of where it can happen. Um, and here's one more example there. So to reiterate the importance of this chapter is the bank reconciliation is very important and your controls over any type of cash are very important. So take a look at this PowerPoint that's posted and as you start your homework, if you have any questions, give me a call. Give me an email. Thanks.